This evening we wish to consider the problem of the relationship between science and what we call scientific materialism. In order to get the necessary perspective, we have to realize that in the progress of Western culture, man moved very gradually but relentlessly from a theistic to a humanistic foundation. The division in time is rather uncertain. There were both theists and humanists in Greece and in the Roman Empire. But we may say for general purposes that modern humanism began in the early 17th century following the Reformation, which more or less cleared the way for free thinking, and then gradually, slowly, and at first rather painfully, advanced its own purposes, which were consummated in both political and intellectual revolutions. The humanistic position rose in importance as man advanced in his knowledge of the natural sciences. In ancient times, scientific principles were known, but they were known much as religious principles were known. They were held as convictions by the learned. There was hardly enough available methodology to permit the scientific approach to knowledge that we know today. But in the 18th and later, more intensely, in the 19th century, the organization of human knowledge passed gradually into the keeping of astronomers, biologists, physicists, and to a measure psychologists. During this time, the struggle between religion and the rise of science was a very keen struggle. And in the United States particularly, this struggle continues even till now. While it is true that psychologically science has come to more and more dominate our intellectual lives, religion still plays a very large and positive part. And the family of the scientist may be devout in some faith, and even the scientist himself may acknowledge a nominal allegiance to some religion. In the vanguard of the scientific motion, of course, there were extremists. And uh, in humanism, these extremis, extremists took a totally materialistic point of view, and we have gradually come to know them either as rather rabid agnostics or actual atheists. In the 20th century, atheism came into fashion in the Western world. It remained fashionable, however, only in certain groups, and its influence was limited to a level of intelligence that was deeply immersed in the advancement of scientific knowledge. We cannot say that, generally speaking, uh, religion has been heavily penalized in the United States, for example, in the rise of science. Perhaps religion, however, has come under a certain negative disfavor. And in higher education especially, we find today skepticism as a basic symbol of intellectual maturity. The individual who believes is held to be 
unscientific. Gradually also there arose this peculiar demarcation by which all knowledge was divided into fact and fantasy. Science became the custodian of fact and all other forms of learning, religion, art, culture, aesthetics, idealism, all of these were grouped together under the general heading of fantasy. Perhaps we can go even further and say that there is this division between science and superstition. What we have not realized is that no such dichotomy exists in nature. Nature does not say this is fact and this is fancy, nor does it divide the different areas of knowledge by any arbitrary intellectual boundary. We might have been a little better off in this rising tide of factualism had we had more facts. But unfortunately, even in science, there is not enough broad area of fact uh, to be able to clearly say that many borderline mysteries are either so or not so. We cannot say, actually, that science possesses all the facts. And while a fact-finding body does not possess the necessary facts, its findings must be advanced with modesty. Science has overlooked this modesty, and at least some of its representatives have gone out to a very difficult and dangerous position. They have taken it for granted that science was the sole custodian of true knowledge, that all forms except those within the acceptances of science, all forms of knowledge which science did not uh, bless with its particular benediction, uh, were worthless, valueless, and meaningless. Now, of course, scientists do not say this, really, because they are always in need of new laboratories. And for the most part, the laboratories are built by these superstitious people who still have faith in something and some of them even have faith in the scientists. This type of situation also sometimes makes us wonder if such faith is not a little superstitious. But in any event, the struggle in the United States has been a slow one. And uh, probably around 1920 or shortly thereafter, the rise of Russian communism resulted in the gradual arising here of a certain type of American, quite a sincere, honorable citizen, who did, however, uh, have a certain cause in common with the Russian Bolsheviks and uh, uh, anarchists. He was dissatisfied. He was one of those who had read enough, perhaps, of Karl Marx to come to the conclusion that most human misfortunes were due to too much theology. He gradually came to associate religion with stagnation, with the, the constant persecution of progress. And he also liked, perhaps, to agree with Karl Marx that most of the common social sins of mankind are due uh, to religion blocking the natural inquiry of the human mind. Being in this sense of the word a bit of a rebel in his own right, he gradually gathered others of his kind to become what might be termed campus atheists. They were young people, uh, they were sincere, uh, they were knight errants with not much of a cause, but they were doing the best they could. They felt, as many young people do, that they must fight for something. 
And today, in our way of thinking, when you fight for something, you must also fight against something. So by degrees, this group, growing older, got into some rather strategic positions, and little by little, uh, the scientific world uh, began to feel the pressure of these uh, not mature, thoughtful atheists, but mostly just disillusioned people who, not having found God particularly interested in them, decided that they no longer had any interest in God. It was all rather amateurish, but it did produce a rather deep scar in our way of life. And this scar we still have to struggle with, because it has gradually indoctrinated a large part of our educational theory, and particularly in higher education, we are at least indirectly inspired to believe that we should not believe in anything except science and education. It has been, as we say, a slow fight, and I reiterate this for a particular purpose. I want to keep reminding you that this struggle uh, was up and through a nominally religious world. In this country, the little white churches have always been dotted throughout our communities. And contrary to many other countries, the young as well as the old were deeply devout in their religious allegiances. Today, we probably have a, a very strong religious body in the United States. It is estimated at the approximately 90 million of our people. So, actually, science never had its perfect works with us. It never was able to get completely rid of this superstition and build its own kind of a world. It was never able to completely uh, escape the need for diplomacy, for caution, and for moderation of attitude. And uh, perhaps this in some way, ways helped the scientist uh, to keep a little more middle ground. Also here, we do not suffer very much from religious persecution, and the old superstitions against which the humanists first hurl their thunder are not, enough, are not of enough importance in our way of life now to form very much of an enemy. So science did not have very much of a case. It had no particular need to attack anyone terribly because no one was doing anything that was uh, particularly awful. Thus the situation sort of dwindled. And we come down to the year 1962 with a rather interesting and somewhat confusing picture in the relationships between science and the everyday life of our people. Also, we have to realize that scientists do get together, uh, that they have their own arguments and discussions, uh, that they are not really quite as certain of themselves as perhaps the press suggests. Perhaps they have had a certain aura of infallibility bestowed upon them, but they do not wear it with any great amount of real comfort. Uh, they are not too certain of their own position in many matters. One thing they have learned, however, within the last 15 years, and that is that science can be extremely dangerous. Now, they found this out in a world in which science is not even dominant. It has made a certain allegiance with policy in matters of armament. It has made an allegiance with society in matters of health. Of hygiene. It has made an allegiance in, with industry in terms of the advancement of a mechanistic way of life, and it has certainly dabbled strongly in the economy of the nation. But still the scientist is only a scientist, and around him moves a world with many other factors. He felt rather good about everything until he began to explore more deeply into his electronic 
mysteries. Here he found he was getting a little out of control. And uh, I know from talking to a number of these men that they're not quite comfortable. Uh, they're not so much worried about themselves. Uh, they are pretty well sure, each one of them, uh, that uh, is a man of honor. But they're wondering about the others. They're wondering about what the scientist in the next laboratory is doing. Is he also honorable? Is he beyond the temptations which common folks suffer from? And out of the entire situation has come the sobering thought uh, that science is getting hold of information and methods uh, which are very dangerous, critically dangerous. And the scientist does now what he did 20 years ago. He tries to disclaim responsibility for the use made of his own discoveries. He says that he is going to turn them over to other people whose specialty is morality and ethics and that these should administer his discoveries. But he forgets to tell us that during the course of education, he himself warned young people not to study morality and ethics but to get down to the good hard facts of biology and physics. So we have some pretty good biologists, and some pretty good physicists, but the enrollment in the ethics and culture courses has not been up to date very good. It's like the course in philosophy. The university may have a department of science with 200 instructors and a department of philosophy with five, three of them on the verge of retiring. This is the situation as we have had it. Now everyone wonders why. We also feel, however, that because of the slow uh, encroachment of science, and because there is still a large reservoir of faithful and devout persons in this Western world, that we may be able to absorb the shock of scientific progress and still keep our heads. We have therefore seen only a slowly conditioned advance in this area. Now on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, our communist competitors have had an entirely different background. And this is rather intriguing. After the Bolshevik Revolution and the gradual rise of uh, the Soviet republics, uh, the scientist found himself in an almost perfect atmosphere. He found himself in a country in which atheism was a law of the state. He found that every force of importance in the country was on his side. Everything was done that was conceivable to humiliate and to discourage religious observance. Everything was done uh, to cause young people to become highly fact-minded. Uh, Russia at that time was engaged in the beginning of a great struggle for industrial and economic supremacy. Uh, in that struggle, priests and monks and nuns did not look particularly helpful. Therefore, as far as possible, they were drawn back into industrial society. They were forced either to take the secular employment or else uh, to hazard actual existence. And uh, in the state, the scientist was looked up to because he was free from all of these morbid superstitions. One point, of course, we have to remember that they learned. While they were able to do a great deal to oppose religious belief, the most recent estimates that are possible to obtain on the subject indicate that there are still between 50 and 60 million devout believers in Russia. And by this I don't mean devout believers in communism. I mean devout believers in religion. Most of them belong to the Russian Orthodox Church. 
Now this in itself is a scientific marvel, and even the scientists have begun to meditate upon it. How is it possible to stamp out religion systematically for forty years and have it still there? Not only there, but all of a sudden uh, showing signs of great uh, reviving, uh, shall we say, vitality. Now, we all know what the trouble is in this particular point. While we have been worrying to death about the Russians sending bombs over here some night when we were not looking, they have been well telling their own people the same story. They have told their own people that these nasty capitalistic nations might bomb them at any moment. The result has been a strong religious revival in Russia. <laughs> Not incredible, but interesting. In this moment of uh, great personal peril, the average Russian has not turned to the Kremlin or the party, for he suspects he will find the other members of the party in the next shelter with him. Now comes the great question, if we are all going to be blown to perdition, what matters it whether we belong to the party or not? So Russia is beginning to get a little uneasy about some of these things. And this uneasiness is marked by a double manifestation that is arising, one phase of which is the reviving of the religious life of the Russian people. And in this, religion is playing it rather smart, because the new metropolitan of Russia is now working out a program to make the church compatible with progress, with scientific progress. In other words, it is not necessary now for you uh, to hold a dichotomy against science in order to be religious. This is an interesting little development. But it is something that we are also experiencing, but more slowly. Actually, Russian materialistic science is about 20, 25 years ahead of us, because it had such a beautiful type of background in which to function. It inherited a great many of the disgruntled German scientists after World War II, these gentlemen living in their own curious intellectual isolation uh, devoted their time to the advancing of the various pursuits of science and knowledge, and they gathered together in a strong little band with no one to ridicule them, everyone cheering for them, everyone certain that they were good party members, largely because they didn't believe in anything, including the party, which we now begin to realize is true. So without any opposition from quiet and firm believers who still paid taxes and uh, patronized universities, uh, the Russian materialistic science, scientists went all out in their materialism. Now it seems that they are all in. There's something has happened. And the thing that has happened there, as here, is that the scientist has lost control of his own skill. He has lost control of his inward power to apply the censorship of morality and ethics to his own productions. He suddenly discovers he's a one-track mind, and that that one-track mind is leading him relentlessly and inevitably to World War III. This is a thought that no longer really uh, makes him very happy. So, what could have happened here 20 years ago, uh, 20 years from now, if we had continued as we were, is now happening in Russia, which because of its peculiar structure enabled its scientists to attain a position of dominance which we have not permitted ours to attain. 
So at this time, we notice on both sides of the Atlantic a growing sense that a serious mistake has been made. This growing sense is perhaps due partly to fear, but it is also due partly to the actual progress which science has made. There are indications that science is outgrowing its own materialism. It is reaching a point in its studies of universal phenomena in which it can no longer remain materialistic. I suppose to some scientists this will be an unhappy discovery and some will probably never accept it. Others, however, who are truly scientific in their thinking will not only accept it but will do something about it. We have already learned psychologically that materialism as a basis of human security is a dead loss. We have also learned that scientific aptitudes are no substitute for moral convictions. In uh, almost every area here, we are waking up to the fact that what we call materialism is a dead loss to all concerned. Not only is it is a dead loss, but we are no longer in the days of Huxley and Darwin. We are no longer in the early years of Sigmund Freud. We have gone through a lot since those days, and we are no longer convinced that this wild burst of materialistic enthusiasm meant much. It is therefore interesting, in the light of this, uh, to read a little article that appeared uh, in the New York Times on F February 7th of this year, which has a little bearing on our subject. This article is by Harrison E. Salisbury, who was the former Moscow correspondent of the New York Times, who recently revisited the Soviet Union and traveled widely in the country. He says, quote, Within the most advanced echelon of Soviet science, there is emerging a tendency to seek a non-materialistic spiritual concept of the universe. See, they had the chance to go off the deep end. They went well off. Now they have to crawl back. Perhaps from their experience, we may not have to make that dive into foolishness. Back to Mr. Salisbury. This startling development within the elite core of Soviet society is closely related to two collateral tendencies, a new and vigorous Communist Party drive against religious beliefs and a reform move within the Russian Orthodox Church to adapt itself to modern technological society. The fact that some of the most brilliant Soviet scientists suggest that there must exist in the universe a force or power that is superior to any possessed by man is said to have shocked conventionally minded Communist Party functionaries. My, how easily they are shocked. <laughs> how widespread this tendency is cannot be established, for names have not been given. But there is reason to believe that some of the most eminent figures in the galaxy of Soviet physicists, astronomers, and mathematicians are involved. They are men of great influence. It may be presumed that the tendency that they represent will not long be confined to the field of science. These men have not become believers in a formal religion or dogma. Their faith is more akin to that appearing among many of their Western scientific colleagues, but they are no longer atheists. Uh, this is a rather light statement of it. But the translations that are being made by the United States government of Soviet and Red Chinese scientific publications supplies us with many of the names that are not mentioned here. The big names are in the movement. Now, it isn't so important, perhaps, to us uh, that these are Russians. Perhaps it is important. But we must remember that the scientific world is a level of itself. Russian scientists, German scientists, French scientists, American scientists, Hindu scientists all speak the same language. 
They are all concerned with the same basic attitudes. We are therefore dealing with an upheaval within a strata, within one of the several levels of our higher intellectualism, and to the average Western person today, one of the highest levels. This marked reversal of opinion, which is also appearing more and more among our own scientific leaders, may tell us something that is important for us to remember, namely that science will ultimately, must ultimately, uh, learn certain things about the universe which are incompatible uh, with what we know today as atheism. This will throw the scientist into a quandary and into a dilemma. We cannot expect and have no reason to expect that scientists will go back uh, to any formal theology uh, now generally uh, held in the world. Some will go back symbolically, because wherever there is a sudden revulsion against uh, an extreme attitude, this revulsion may cause the individual to return to the opposite extreme. But broadly speaking, the trend is not from science to theology, but from science to a new concept of divine providence, or a new understanding of universal realities. Uh, James Jeans made that swing some time ago. It wasn't particularly well received in the West. It was considered that he was merely getting to be an elderly gentleman. And when Dr. Milliken did the same thing, he was regarded with some pity and considerable disfavor from among his own group. These were simply men ahead of their time. But the sober fact remains that when the top group of the scientific world begins to think this way, the inevitable result is going to be a complete reshuffling of our attitude towards life and our attitude toward the universe and our attitude ultimately toward our fellow men. Looking over some of the information that is now gradually uh, developing, we find one clear statement appearing in uh, Western scientific thinking, that we must get rid forever of this dichotomy of God and nature, of heaven and earth, of God and man. These dichotomies are not any longer valid, and science is already moving toward the position in which a complete unity of life fact is becoming obvious. In other words, what we would term the universe is merely God in motion. It is not a different thing. Man is, is actually the universe in motion also. There is only one tremendous, all-controlling agency. All things exist in this agency and are of it. And what we have called various divisions, setting up arbitrary terms to divide the universe into an infinite fragmentation, this is now regarded scientifically as improper. That whatever we are going to have, whatever we are going to discover, we are going to discover one eternal principle, one eternal fact one immutable, inevitable power. And we're going to discover as we go along that this immutable power cannot be uh, mindless, cannot be merely mechanistic, that this power is not merely fuel in a tank, this power is not merely some form of superior electricity arising merely from the friction of space or something of that nature. This power 
obviously is revealed through its own production, and it produces something from itself that reveals beyond any question or doubt that it is also omniscient. So we are now beginning to be aware in science that we must either find or postulate this primary mover of all things, that we must recognize that this great plan of things must, by its own evidence, bear witness to the planner of this thing. Uh, when we didn't know too much about the universe, uh, the plan didn't seem as large as it does now. But when we go into electronics and things of this degree of intensity, we become more and more aware of the immutables of law and process. We become more and more aware of the incredible potential of existence itself. Our forebears scratching a hazardous existence from the earth did not know these things. Uh, they knew it rained, and they knew the floods came, and that it snowed. And also they knew that the harvest would come in proper season, all other things being reasonable. But they had no concept of what we know today. They had no concept of what the, is now the common knowledge of a laboratory research, research technician. He lives in a world that is more than he can comprehend. He is surrounded by other people who are penetrating into various aspects of it, as he is. There is scarcely a day when a great discovery is not made, but tomorrow there will be another. And this process of infinite discovery does not seem to come to any end. We do not find the discovery that ends all discovery. All we ever find is a discovery that leads to more discovery. This kind of a universe really becomes too big for the individual uh, to estimate with the limited faculties at his own disposal. He is therefore forced almost uh, to an attitude which we would term one of veneration and which uh, materialists term one of superstition. He is led to come to the rather obvious conclusion that in the universe everything is possible. In the universe there is no way of even guessing what ultimates will be. To face this kind of a universe and face it uh, merely as a machine or a mechanized organism becomes less and less possible. The individual must either be lost in this, or he must affirm and assume his own place in it. And in order to protect himself from his overwhelming insignificance, man must begin to include himself in the great universal processes which go on around him. Little by little, therefore, the scientific mind is coming face to face with too much evidence of an intelligent, conscious universe. He has not experienced this consciousness or this intelligence, but he beholds it. He receives the testimony of it through his sensory perceptions. He is surrounded by it. And as his own experiments go on, he becomes more aware of how invisible, incredible forces can and do operate continuously. The Russians have found this. They have also made the negative discovery, which we are also making today, and that is that man himself is so constituted in his own psychic organism that he flourishes only 
when his integrities are reasonably secure. Man has to have faith. As one of the old Greeks said, man is a religious animal. Man has within himself the inevitable determination to believe. And the reason he has this determination is that it is essential to his survival. Long before man can hope to comprehend the mystery of the universe, he must assume it. He must accept it. And out of a very simple childlike faith, he must, must take hold of universal phenomena and see in it hope rather than despair. He cannot live in a universe composed entirely of mechanistic factors because himself he is not a machine. If he had no intuition, if he had no emotion, if he had no inward hopes and aspirations that transcend the actual mechanistic problems of survival, if he did not have these, he might be content to live in a universe made up of machines. But man is not so constituted. He is not content. We have only one way of knowing uh, at our level of insight whether man is right or wrong. Uh, this old process of dogmatizing these things is not especially practical, although we must admit that in old dogma there is much truth sometimes, but also there is tendency to error. The only thing that we can be perfectly sure of is that nature's processes support those that are consistent with them that creatures, in order to enjoy the maximum uh, security in any natural situation, must obey the laws of that situation. If they wish to become wiser, it means that they must become wiser in relation to these laws. If they wish to contribute to progress, they must help to advance these laws, not some other laws. Man, therefore, experiences a twofold destiny. He finds that some of the things that he does make him better, make him happier, healthier, lengthen his life, give him a more serene existence here. Other things which he does obviously are not according to nature's will, and he is promptly punished. He is punished in various ways. Most of all, he is deprived of the support of nature. He finds that his affairs do not go well. He finds that his health is disturbed, his emotions are disturbed, his mind is disturbed. He discovers that if he keeps the laws around him, keeps faith with something, this faith sustains and supports him. If he breaks faith with this thing, it turns upon him and apparently persecutes him, actually, however, merely depriving him of his birthright of a place in nature's program of progress. Thus, we have one simple criterion that we can use again and again. Are we able to survive what we do? Is this thing which we are doing contributing to progress? If it is, it is contributing to good. It is contributing to happiness. It is contributing to well-being. If what we do does not contribute to some constructive end and does not bear a good fruit, then what we are doing is not right. So psychologists taking this hint, which the physicists have tossed to them, I've now come to the conclusion that when you take man and take his religion away from him, get rid of all his superstitions and polish him up thoroughly, instead of being a nice, happy person, he's just a hopeless neurotic. They have found out that when you try to tell the individual that his beliefs are no good, 
that he should outgrow them, he may accept your remark and pine away almost immediately. He is not any better. Time and time again, the individuals who have gone to a materialistic psychologist for help have left without help, perhaps even worse off because they've lost faith in something. This is becoming so obvious throughout the field that the psychologist is forced to come, as several have recently, to the simple conclusion that belief in God is part of human health, and if you haven't got it, you're sick. Now, this is far more important than whether you can prove it theologically or not, because there is no proof that is more immediately interesting to the individual than that which is registered in his own blood pressure. If he finds, as most have found, that a reasonable, normal belief helps to make life meaningful, then this individual has found this part of natural truth, and he finds that this part of natural truth is valuable to it. Science also is forced to look, at least give a quick side glance, uh, to the result of the materializing of human society. It sees now that nearly every institution that is important to the survival of man has been undermined by lack of ethics. The scientist is beginning to recognize that in the name of science and in the name of scientific procedure, he is hazarding the very survival of science. He is creating a world uh, which will use science to destroy itself and science with it. Thus the uh, thoughtful scientist himself, particularly the scientific historian, is forced to admit that materialism has been a dismal failure, a noble experiment, and in no way worth saving. Now this means, of course, that a world scientifically trained must seek a different kind of approach to religion than that of a world which was not so trained. And here the mention that we made of the effort of the Russian Orthodox Church to meet the challenge of a technological society is worth giving another thought to. Apparently the Russian Orthodox Church is convinced that it can save religion without depending upon the old armament of religious dogmas. And I think they are probably quite right, because it was the old armament that was destroying religion, just as it is the new materialism that was destroying science. Out of this must then, must then arise the concept of a religion that is suitable to the man of today and the man of tomorrow a religion in which there is no conflict between theology and science. Uh, this type of unification should be possible because it has actually been accomplished in the private lives of many people. It is not as difficult or terrible a reconciliation as we might at first suppose. It simply means that the individual begins to interpret his universe in terms of meaning, as well as merely in terms of matter. The moment you add meaning to matter, you have conviction of some kind, and conviction we must have. One of the big problems that faces science today in the matter of conviction is also its a long, dramatic struggle against the delusion of immortality. Science have become, scientists have become actually enraged at the stupidity of people who insist that they want to live after they're dead. What could be more utterly ridiculous and what could be more utterly unscientific? Well, I can think of things 
uh, that parts will fall into that classification, but we don't need to pause with them. The fact now comes out that everybody is worried about this. Uh, for example, nearly everybody in the world, politically at least, has got an ideology of some kind that they are trying to foist upon mankind. The communists want a communist world. The proletarians of other nations want their private brand of proletarianism. Uh, Western nations want their particular type. And every country has some kind of a remedy for the ills of man which it wishes to popularize. We are convinced the democratic way of life is good. Whether we call it a republic or a democracy, this is what we've got. And we are beginning to view very favorably the idea of an eternal welfare state. But one problem uh, seems to put a fly in the ointment. What does it all mean if no one is going anywhere? No one is ever going to know it or not, and no one is ever ultimately going to care what we had, or how we got it, or whether we kept it or lost it. The whole thing is rounded by such a futility that it's getting more and more difficult to live with ourselves. Now the prospect or possibility of being blown up in our scientific prime also makes uh, a certain cause of apprehension. The scientist himself, where is he going? If he is the victim of a direct hit, where is he? What difference does it make whether he uh, graduated Phi Beta Kappa or flunked the course? <laughs> He can say, well, if I graduated cum laude, at least my friends were all glad about it. And as a result of that, I was able to attain a higher social dignity. Everyone called me Herr Professor or Doctor. But realize that after he's blown up, he's not even going to remember what they called him. <laughs> Now the communist peoples are building a new world order. They are going to make the world safe for the proletarian. Uh, they are going to have five-year plans and ten-year plans, and nobody knows how many-year plans, in order that a great idea, the idea of Marx and Engels, shall ultimately wave its banner triumphantly over the earth. Do these people realize that if that, this happens, they're not even going to know about it? We're going to have this great socialized country, which is the fulfillment of our desires. It may not be anything our descendants want, but we think they do. But we're not going to know it. So we pass it on to them. We're not building for our own frail mortality. We are building for the future. Now we suddenly wonder about the frail mortality of the future. All our children, their children, and their children to eternity are also all going to stop remembering that they ever existed. So that actually our memory is just a little span of years. Then there isn't anything. And no one will know, no one will care, and we will not know nor care. There will be no evidence in space whether we came before or after the dinosaur. But we will be as dead as the dinosaur. <laughs> so uh, with this general thinking, we have a tremendous futility. I know one scientist got rather excited about it when he suddenly realized that according to the best calculations, the planet is not going to last more than another 10 or 20 billion years. <laughs> At the end of that time, all progress will go up in smoke, steam, or whatever is used to terminate planets. There isn't any more. And in face of this famous line, 
there isn't any more. What are we all getting excited about? What is the end of this thing? And science can no longer tell us that the great victory is a full stomach. Men can die on a full stomach also. <laughs> and when they're dead, they will not know whether their stomach was full or not. When we rest, as Omar said, uh, with the world's last 7,000 years, who cares? What are we doing? Materialism, as it affects the problem of immortality, leaves us with absolutely nothing worth doing. There is no more reason why we should be great than that we should become a wino and wander around spending our weekends in the county jail. It all means nothing. Because in oblivion there is neither a preferred group nor an unpreferred group. What is it all going? Where is it all going? Everybody thought in Russia that they were doing a very unkind trick to Stalin when they took his remains away from his partner in the Kremlin. But if they're correct, he doesn't even know it. He never will know it. And in a few years, they will not know they did it. <laughs> Most discouraging. So science has to do something about this. Because science can never maintain an ethical universe with nothing going anywhere or coming from anywhere. We cannot face uh, any human hope. We cannot give the human being anything to build on. If we make him a little spot of biological life in a universe of eternal terminations. So as soon as he gets through trying to figure out whether the universe has an intelligent principle in it or not, he's got to begin thinking about what this intelligent principle might have planned for its creatures rather than what he thinks it planned. And if science comes to the conclusion, which it is coming to so rapidly that it'll probably be here within four or five years, that this universe is ruled over by an eternal conscious principle, it's going to have to revive and revise its thinking about the termination of anything. We are going to come face to face with the problem of an eternal existence in an eternal creation, ever changing but never ceasing. The lack of this concept of life after death has certainly contributed very largely to the rise of crime and delinquency in the world in the last 15 years. We might have endured it because other people's deaths we read about, and our own we do not any longer talk about, because we are not in any position to. But in the problem of a great world catastrophe, in which perhaps millions of human beings will be the instantaneous victims of sublime progress, these things get to be important. And the question is, if the bomb hits, where do we go from here? Someone has to find the answer. If we do not find an answer, we're going to fall into a chaos, the same kind of chaos that was typified in a small symbolic way by the man standing at the front of his fallout shelter with the shotgun to keep other people out. This is about all we've been trained to do. But this becomes an intolerable state of affairs, utterly unworthy of a human being. So, science is now wrestling with the reason for itself. What has the whole development of science meant if man 
has no existence other than the few years that he spends here. The next thing that science is going to have to struggle with, and struggle with rather seriously, is the problem of what constitutes morality and ethics. What is a good man? In all our excitement, we haven't gotten around to this yet. We know what makes smart men, but we do not know what makes good men. We have faith in good men, but we're afraid of smart men. And we have too many people to be afraid of these days. So what is this better type of being, this better type of person that we would all like to see in high office or to see uh, in some way in authority to regulate the affairs of mankind? We know that down through time we seem to have produced some persons whom we consider better types of people. We also know by looking into the lives of these better types of people that they had strong internal characters, that they were people of faith, of vision, of insight, of courage, of unselfishness, and most perhaps important to us, of honor. Thus, the better type of person begins to emerge as an archetype in this confusion. And even science now, particularly psychology, is beginning to talk about complete people. No longer people walking around on one leg or with one arm or with one eye. In other words, people who have been rescued from intellectual and scientific surrealism. We are not very fond of some of the kinds of paintings that we see, where we can't tell whether it's a human being or an omelet. <laughs> and as we look inside of ourselves psychologically, we cannot always be sure whether we are human beings or omelets. And this is not any longer satisfactory. So we begin to think of complete people. And when we think of complete people, who do we think about? I don't think we think of Sigmund Freud. I doubt very much if we think of Adolf Hitler. And I'm reasonably certain that we don't think of Mr. Khrushchev. When we think of complete people, we think of those noblest examples of man, who in character, in principles, in integrities, and in values, were the archetypes of what we know all human beings should be. Therefore, perhaps we think of Jesus or Buddha or Zoroaster or Confucius or Lao Tzu, Socrates, Plato, Pythagoras. These were the people to our thinking who were most nearly complete people. We have a different way of defining them now, but the substance is not essentially different. To us, a complete person is one who is able to administer his own life with dignity. A complete person is one who has his job and his friends, his joys, his love, his health, and the respect of his fellow men. This complete person is not merely a scientist. He may not be lacking in science, but if he is a scientist, he may be also a musician, a great lover of art, a great student of culture. He may find not only the joy of exploring space, but the quiet enjoyment of reading a great poem. This complete person is one who lives a full life, a life enriched by all forms of evidence which improve conduct and character. So we're looking for this kind of person. And we know that we cannot find him unless we create him. Buddha is very clear on this point, and no thought was ever more honest, that every individual has to be the sculptor of his own character. 
that he has to find ways to develop those values which are necessary. His educational system, his environment, and his society are expected to encourage in him the fullest development of his own character. If these institutions fail to so encourage him, they fail in their own purpose. A man has a right to change, correct, or if necessary, remove that which is no longer useful to him. So the search for the complete person is on. And perhaps the reason it is coming so directly to our attention is this tremendous increase in neurosis. And neurotics are not people who have simply gotten sick for no good reason. Most of them have hurt themselves, that there is no doubt. But most of the hurt is also due to the fact that they never had the equipment necessary to help themselves. Every social inducement was to make them sick, none to help them to be well. This has to be changed, and we have to find that this search for the complete person uh, is the most practical thing in the world, because it is this person who must administer progress. This is the person into whose hands the secrets of universal energy must pass. And these hands must be pure of those defilements by which perversion is likely to be possible. So science, looking to its own salvation, has no salvation but ethics. And ethics depends upon philosophy. And all these must hasten to the aid of science, or science is going to fall apart from its own one-pointedness, uh, from its own insistence its own fanatical determination that science and science alone shall become the arbiter of man's destiny. It simply is incapable of this function. It is acknowledgedly only one part of knowledge, and it is trying to usurp all of the world of knowledge, which it is not capable of usurping and not able to administer. So to get out of its dilemma, science is willing again to give a second look at this crazy old institution called religion. It is beginning to recognize the need for this. We are, of course, going to be able to build a great deal of a broader religious concept out of the very findings of our times. But these findings, again, have to do principally, strangely enough, with space. All of the findings of science put together have contributed practically nothing to our moral growth. And all of the techniques of science have contributed very little to the technique for the improvement of man himself as a person. So we haven't the wide and wonderful choice in this area that we might have in some others. If we want to find a better electric toaster, we can choose from 50 blends. We have brands of every type and kind. But when we want to choose from a better way of life, we cannot choose from contemporary knowledge because it simply is not available. Almost everything worth knowing on that subject belongs to periods long remote. At some remote time, man seemed to be really concerned with living. And we must apparently turn to those times for our encouragement and inspiration in this emergency. There has been very little added to man's spiritual knowledge of his own needs or of spiritual solutions to those needs in the last 15 centuries. There have been minor contributions, but the great work was done long before that even. And on those foundations we must find something that is suitable to our needs. It is obvious that probably the only 
answers that we have lie in religious doctrines which were not overly theistic in their own time, but were strictly humanitarian and strictly utilitarian. We are not going to be able to go back to the old gods, but we must go back uh, to the systems which gave us the strongest defenses against the dangers of the unknown and the misused. And, of course, I have always felt rather strongly that one of our best sources of information on this subject was Buddha. The first place he has been called an atheist. He has been called an atheist because he held very largely the exact point that is now coming out, namely that the universe is under the rulership, under the leadership of one vast eternal consciousness. What he'd said in his time almost parallels the elite core of Russian scientists. He did not wish to become involved in theology, and he never was. He gave to his followers a simple formula, namely that the universe is a vast instrument for the maturing and developing of the inner life of man. That this inner life, as we call it, is the real life that it is the development of this inner life that preserves the outer world in which we live. And to the degree that the inner life fails, human society also fails. For this reason, everything depends upon the individual developing an internal sense of value to respect that which is most worthy of respect to venerate that which is most venerable, uh, to conduct oneself in harmony with that which is most true and necessary, and to hold at all times that attitude which is most likely to advance the tranquility and peace of mankind. These things put together constitute a working religion. And beyond this, very little theology is necessary. For it is up to man now to labor with Buddha's four great truths. Man must clearly understand and solve for all times these four truths. The noble truth of the cause of suffering. The noble truth of the end of suffering the noble truth of the path that leads to the end of suffering, and the noble truth of suffering itself apart from all other conditions. Man is suffering. The world is suffering. Society is in the striving of a great suffering. Mental emotional sickness is suffering. World famine is suffering. World bigotry and persecution, these are suffering. Everywhere today, uh, the individual seems to be getting along, but the vast body of society is in a great pain, a pain which is breaking through in every level of our living. This problem has to be solved. We must face the fact that until we end suffering, we have never perfected science. That science is not merely to give more luxuries to those who can afford them and leave suffering untouched. Science is not going to be able to solve anything by being the first on the moon, but the last to remove the causes of common suffering on earth. 
We, uh, we like to think that science wants to cure suffering. And in the last 25 years, there has been great progress in the healing of disease. We have remedies for many ailments that we never previously were able to cope with. We are able to lengthen life considerably over the probabilities of 20 years ago. But we haven't touched suffering. For every new step in our way confronts us with new pain. And those who have lived a little longer have in most cases only suffered a little longer. The great cause of the whole problem has never been faced. Our religious life, then, must be concerned with these truths, the truth of suffering, the truth of the cause of suffering, the truth of the end of suffering, and the truth of the path that leads to the end of suffering. Until this is achieved, man can never build his golden age or can never arrive at the time of peace and security he hopes for. These problems are both scientific and religious problems. Therefore, on this level, science and religion serve one purpose. There is no dichotomy. On this level, the goals of both are the same. For it is the end of both science and religion to discover the means to bring about the end of suffering. Uh, this is all types of suffering, mental anguish, emotional anguish, poverty, sickness, crime, everything that we know. For in fact and truth, to have come as far in certain forms of knowledge as we have, and left untouched these great fountainheads of our misery, is a strange reflection upon our understanding and our character. But the end of both of these great needs must be found in the area of increasing knowledge and increasing insight. If science can discover for us the conscious universe, it is then the duty of other departments to discover the will, the pleasure, the law, the needs of that conscious universe, and to obey these, and to fulfill them and to meet them in every way possible according to the understanding and insight that we can possess. So out of this comes the full realization that science does not need to be materialistic, that there is nothing in the entire world of knowledge that forces a scientist to say, I must deny God in order to defend science. There is no reason why any man should have to say, I deny science because I believe in God. There is no possible cause for such a division. For actually, science and religion are working with the same problem and the same substances. The only difference is that one is approaching them almost completely from the level of scientific intellectualism, and the other is much more warmly moved by emotional and mystical incentives. It is probable that many scientists serve for the love of man. I believe that those who go out and give their lives in distant places or serving great epidemics or attempting to save man in disaster these people are great, unselfish persons. I believe that many scientists have as high and noble a resolution in themselves as those, perhaps, who have uh, more theological uh, affiliations. But still, for the most part, the scientist does not permit himself the warmth of a great mystical enthusiasm about life. He feels that if ever he would becomes truly a lover of life, he will be a betrayer of science. 
This is a completely stupid attitude. Because actually, science must lead to a great, full joy of life. If the scientist cannot enjoy science, and if the religious person cannot enjoy religion, what have we left? Many scientists are moved by duty. Many religious people are moved by duty. And both these groups are made up of miserable people. It is not a problem of duty. It is a problem of simple, joyous recognition of the facts of the matter. Science is not in any way required uh, in the advancement of itself to deny the power within the scientist by which he can be a scientist. And this has really caused a lot of thought. A scientist says to himself, I am a person dedicated to science. Then he stops and says, Who am I? He knows, for example, that somewhere within the mysterious uh, recesses of the brain of Einstein, there was something that could come to amazing conclusions, and that these conclusions could later be demonstrated to be true. So that actually the great discoveries of science are not made by science. They are made by men, by human beings. They are made by people like the pastors and others who have given us things we desperately needed. So actually, the reason why we have science is simply because we are alive. We have science because there is something inside of us that no one has ever been able to understand completely by means of which we are capable of, de of developing scientific interests and remembering a scientific education. Without this life in ourselves, there could be no science. So the scientist is confronted with the fact that he is alive. Not only that he is alive, but that he is capable of continuously learning that more and more can come out of him at every moment. Then he looks around and perhaps a little grudgingly admits that non-scientists are also alive. This is called broad-mindedness. <laughs> but he also notices among them of these non-scientists some very interesting people also, great composers, great artists, great technicians in other areas. He finds those who are able to fashion great art and others who are able to build great industrial empires. And he realizes that all skill and all knowledge is not scientific, but that it is related to many fields of interest. But all this knowledge, all that we know, is coming from somewhere. So that we are really suspended between two unknown universes the one on the outside that goes on and on and on to infinity, in which we are now beginning to suspect that there is an indwelling consciousness. Then we go into the universe inside of man, behind, and on and on and on backward, not only through him, but through all of his kind and all other living things, and we discover an infinite universe of things there. We find four billion human beings, no two alike, each with an inner life, which we cannot understand, and which is perhaps more profound than we will ever know, because at most all we can see is a fragment of what that inner life is able to release into expression. Just in the un as in the universe, we can only see that fragment of universal procedure which we can comprehend. So we have an infinitude at both extremes, and it is one infinity. We have, therefore, not only the problem of the consciousness lurking in space, we have the problem of the consciousness lurking in the infinite potential of man's own existence, a consciousness that is bursting through man as radiantly as any sun bursting through the walls of space. 
So we have not only to assume that somewhere in the furthermost is consciousness, but we must begin to assume that somewhere in the innermost is consciousness. That these, that these two so-called divided things are really only one thing. That the innermost and the outermost are the same thing. But that most of what's in between belongs there also, in these vast categories. Science must consequently assume not only the existence of consciousness in space, but must admit it in man. If he does not, then he has no way to explain the fact that he is a scientist, or capable of being anything. These thoughts are uh, rather diverting. We don't ponder them much because you can't bottle them and sell them for $15. Uh, we don't see immediate profit from this. There's certain satisfaction being the first on the moon, but there doesn't seem to be much glory in being the first person in the neighborhood with common sense. This isn't glamorous. So we continue to go into these other things and neglect this primary thing, which is the instrument of our own integration. Out of it all, science must finally wake up, as has become a trend, not only in Europe but here, uh, to the restoration of a religion that is exactly what man needs. This type of a religion cannot be under the domination of science. We cannot put man's name in a machine and have his proper theology come out the other end. We do, however, need to realize that his theological needs, his religious requirements, have as a framework or as a pattern a very important ingredient. Whatever we find out what his needs really are, we will probably find the truth. This is what the ancients decided. Namely, that if you ever understand man, the rest of the mystery is solved. And that uh, you can approach it from the other end, which we have been doing, trying to explain the universe first and then assume that it will answer the question about man. But the universe is too big to be explained by the facilities which we possess. We can keep on prying into the mystery, but we're not going to arrive very soon. We can, however, arrive much more rapidly at the simple conclusion of what man needs, and in this way, in all probability, discover the fact as it is. Whatever puts man in order, will be the same force that keeps the universe in order. So we begin to look for this, and we come to the conclusion that over all skills, over all artistries, over all scientific facts, there is a thing which we can call purpose. Without purpose, everything else is meaningless. With purpose, everything else is meaningful. Consequently, what we must bestow upon man is what we know the universe must have, and that is purpose. We cannot contemplate the vastness of space with its infinite machinery infinitely operating without the natural and inevitable conclusion that there is a reason for it. It is absolutely inconceivable that a thing of the magnitude of the world as we begin to see it could possibly exist without a reason, without some purpose that has to be achieved. And we also suspect that down through the infinite vistas of aeons, the universe has been moving relentlessly and inevitably toward that purpose, and that the endless transformation everywhere present in the small part of the universe that we can understand, these transformations are parts of the fulfillment of that purpose. These transformations themselves are orderly, reasonable, and have obviously a 
purpose even in the small world of our understanding. So we now conceive, as science is beginning to conceive, a purposed universe. This is fine. We're gaining on it rapidly. But now we have another problem. We've got to find the purposeful man. We have got to discover the purpose for man. It's not possible to conceive that he is the only thing in the universe without a purpose. Sometimes it seems that he might be, but we consider this uh, negative thinking. Actually, man has a purpose. Now, what that purpose is may or may not be easy to discover. Perhaps that purpose rests in the infinite consciousness, and only the infinite can fully know. If this be true, then we have only one choice, and that is to accept the infinite purpose, following it without knowing, but simply by the simplest process possible, and that is by obeying. If we are part of a universal purpose, and it has its own way, then the only thing we can do is cooperate. And until we are able to fully understand, we can only help as best we can. We're not going to be called upon at the moment to help maintain the equilibrium of the galaxy. That's ob obvious. But it may be that it is our natural and proper demand, perfectly reasonable in nature, that we do help to advance the purposes of known things and known purposes which we do understand, and which obviously and reasonably may be said to be supporting the universal purpose. So we say, how can we know this? What part of universal purpose can we understand? What do we make out of all this vast body of phenomena in terms of a purposed plan? And when we look around for an answer, we look right straight at a scientist. And he kind of blushes a little around the ears, because he doesn't know either. The thing he should have been doing was find this out. That was the end of science. That was the purpose for science, was that science should bring to man a clear insight into the operation of universal procedure. And science's duty was to, forfeit, was to continually remind man that knowledge is only useful to the degree that it directs man in the advancement of his own destiny. So science should have given us, by now, a rather thorough concept of the universal code of ethics, what would be certainly true in nature, what would be inevitably true about those principles of nature with which the scientist is becoming increasingly familiar. But he remains worried only about gravity and things of this nature when he should be worrying about meaning, about the interpretation of all that he can learn to the immediate need of all who stand waiting for understanding. Once you have come to the conclusion of the purposed universe, and there has to be a purpose, it isn't even safe to assume that there isn't. And we then stand in the immediate need of our own purpose. Why are we here? Well, we've had a lot of good philosophical thoughts on this subject. Some felt that we uh, feel that we are here to pay our old debts. Others feel that we are here primarily to make new debts. And this is very fashionable under the extended credit system. <laughs> but everyone who has thought at all has come to the conclusion that we're here for some reason. The essential reason for all existence, apparently, is in nature, is that it shall be fruitful. 
that it shall fill its harvest, that it shall grow up to its maturity, and then it shall bear its fruit according to its nature. And if it bears not good fruit, it shall be cast into the fire. This is what the good old hellfire damnation artist told us about it. One thing, if either a man must be fruitful in some way, or his life is not complete. He must create something. He must leave some testimony to his own maturity. He must grow. He must increase in knowledge and understanding. He must become more capable of handling his own life more wisely and efficiently. If he does not achieve some of these things, he regards himself pretty much a failure. The man's purpose is in some way bound to universal purpose. And today the great knowledge must be the knowledge of this purpose. When we understand man's purpose, when we understand the laws by which man can achieve his purpose, and in which he can become aware of the vast and noble destiny which is his proper place in a program of eternal progress, he will have the elements of a new religion. He will have the religion of obedience. He will have the religion of admitting the universal plan and the universal planner. He will also realize what constitutes re true religion, that is, keeping the laws which he calls the laws of God but which we can call just as well the laws of consciousness. So religion becomes obeying the universal consciousness under which and in which we exist. If we learn to obey this consciousness, it will serve and sustain us in our normal emergencies. We have already observed and proven beyond reasonable doubt that misery results from disobedience. We have held that disobedience is due to ignorance. We are now reaching a point where we can no longer fall back upon that fib because it isn't true. It is not any longer a matter of our ignorance. It is a matter of our indifference or our misunderstanding of common things. Under such conditions, I think we can rather safely even restore the dignity of prayer. We can, we can restore the rights of meditation and quietude. We can begin to appreciate perhaps uh, the relationship of the religion of tomorrow, science, and Zen. Where in Zen we have a very good example, perhaps not the one that we will follow, but a very good example of a simple faith that no scientist can disprove, and very few scientists have ever attacked, and a faith which is comparatively free from all superstitions, and yet strangely is strong and devout in its influence upon the life of the individual, helping him to make a closer allegiance between his own consciousness and universal consciousness. The end of all religious hope and religious life is that man shall know God, that man shall thereby experience identity with that universal consciousness which science is beginning to discover. Now, there must be ways of doing this, and science could do a great deal in problems of methodology. It could help us to avoid and eliminate mistakes. It could help us to understand and render more reasonable and purposeful the codes of life by which we live. Science, to science can prove to us much more easily than any other branch of learning why dishonesty does not pay. Science can prove to us why hatred kills. These things science can prove. And under the proof of these things, properly presented, man will begin to understand a little better the integrities of the universe. 
And as science sweeps away certain superstitions that probably have been outgrown, it only clears the way for a clearer and truer and more complete insight about the essentials of the divine plan. Let us hope, then, that in the next five or ten years, this trend will gain greater momentum, that the scientist will proudly affirm his belief in a divine power at the source of life, that we will have our young people brought up in this positive content, that they live in a world ruled by principles that they rule they are ruled not by blind forces or machines or devices created in a laboratory, that we are not going to become a universe of flash gordons. We are going to become a universe of enlightened persons who begin to see the universe in its true splendor, who begin to recognize that truly creation itself is the living temple and that before the wonders of this creation, both the scientist and the common man, so to say, the unschooled or untutored one, both must fall on their knees in the adoration of that which alone is real. There is no reason why this cannot happen. The only thing is, science will have to get over some of its prejudices and its bigotries, Religion will have to get over some of its fanaticisms and its restrictions, and we're going to have to face the future together, convinced that in this future we are not going to be led into a materialistic slough of despond. We are going to be led more and more directly towards the mystery of this radiant conscious universe. If we had only been better prepared if our ethics and morality had been cultured and schooled first, we would now be a long way on our way toward world peace. Instead of that, we are standing in a great emergency. But in, even in this emergency, we must still live in a universe ruled by universal consciousness. We must try to find our place in it, we must try to inspire others to do the same. And we must more and more demand of science, wherever possible, that it provide us with what we really need, which we need more than pills and capsules. And this thing that we most seriously and completely need is hope, faith in purpose, conviction, that this universe is what sciences are beginning to realize it is, something so magnificent, so inwardly and outwardly wonderful, so certain, firm, true, and inevitable, that we no longer have to live in these fears, that we no longer have to doubt everything. We no longer have to tear ourselves to pieces with our little allegiances and disagreements here, but we could, could live and can live in the wonderful coordination and unification of universal purpose. This uh, attitude will have to grow, otherwise we will have no end to sickness, no end to the problems of our generation. Thus, it seems definitely to me that we really have no serious problem here. The great problem is that two kinds of people are going to have to wake up. The scientist is going to have to admit what his consciousness inside has always told him and what he has battled desperately to deny, and that is that there is a great truth and that this great truth rules the universe. And other people are going to have to get over a lot of limitations and mistakes which they have made. They're going to have to get over the importance of creed. They're going to have to look straight into the face of the sun if they can, or certainly into the great sky at night, 
And they're going to say, which of these stars belongs to this church and which belongs to that one? And they're going to suddenly realize that even as high above the earth as our uh, astronaut recently attained, it makes no difference. That these things are not important. Uh, people say that they are important because their belief is right and somebody else's belief is wrong. We must gradually rise above this wrongness and rightness of things. We must move victoriously towards, again, this unity in which wrongness ceases and only rightness remains. And all these different groups are going to finally be forced to take their stand firmly on this universal consciousness, that there is this divine power at the source of life, and that religion is to love and serve that power, and that this area of service includes the service of our fellow men, in whom also this spark of the universal is forever present. There will no longer be any need for debate, for discussion, or for creedal restriction. Rather, all attention, energy, time, effort, and thought should be directed toward the greater understanding of this principle. We should not be wasting time arguing with people of other beliefs. We should be wasting our time uh, if we must waste it at all. In the quietudes and relaxations of our lives, our real purpose is not to waste time. Our purpose is to use time. When we use time to strengthen the conviction of truth in ourselves, we use it wisely. When we use time to try to break down the convictions of other men, we use it unwisely. So out of all of the creeds and doctrines and sects which have more or less prevented religion from ever being able to recognize its own universality, must come this better thing. And the faith that knowledge is a universal, that knowledge has broken itself up, that only by the reintegration of knowledge can it reveal its own universality, that religion is a universal, that has been broken up into creeds, and that only by the restoration of its own unity can its universal be released. And man himself is a universal who has been divided artificially and arbitrarily by race and creed and doctrine and dogma and geographical location and languages and beliefs. All these things have broken up the universality in man and left him victim of the greatest adversary of all, diversity. But when the universality in man, the universality in knowledge, the universality in faith, face head on the universality in space, they're going to discover it is all one thing. But it is only when they attain a certain universal insight that they can unite themselves with that which possesses universal insight. Science must know this, should know it, should know it already from its own numerous experiments. But it is coming, and the day will certainly come when we will wonder how a very short-sighted world could ever have supposed that science had to be materialistic or would even choose to be. And it could only say that things like that could happen only in a dark age of some kind. Let us hope we are coming into an age of light. the different areas of knowledge by any arbitrary intellectual boundary. We might have been a little better off in this rising tide of factualism had we had more facts. 
But unfortunately, even in science, there is not enough broad area of fact uh, to be able to clearly say that many borderline mysteries are either so or not so. We cannot say, actually, that science possesses all the facts. And while a fact-finding body does not possess the necessary facts, its findings must be advanced with modesty. Science has overlooked this modesty, and at least some of its representatives have gone out to a very difficult and dangerous position. They have taken it for granted that science was the sole custodian of true knowledge that all forms except those within the acceptances of science, all forms of knowledge which science did not uh, bless with its particular benediction, uh, were worthless, valueless, and meaningless. Now, of course, scientists do not say this, really, because they are always in need of new laboratories. And for the most part, the laboratories are built by these superstitious people who still have faith in something, and some of them even have faith in the scientists. This type of situation also sometimes makes us wonder if such faith is not a little superstitious. But in any event, the struggle in the United States has been a slow one. And uh, Probably around 1920 or shortly thereafter, the rise of Russian communism resulted in the gradual arising here of a certain type of American, quite a sincere, honorable citizen, who did, however, uh, have a certain cause in common with the Russian Bolsheviks and uh, uh, anarchists. He was dissatisfied. He was one of those who had read enough, perhaps, of Karl Marx to come to the conclusion that most human misfortunes were due to too much theology. He gradually came to associate religion with stagnation, superstition, and build its own kind of a world. It was never able to completely uh, escape the need for diplomacy, for caution, and for moderation of attitude. And uh, perhaps this in some way ways helped the scientists uh, to keep a little more middle ground. Also here we do not suffer very much from religious persecution and the old superstitions against which the humanists first hurled their thunder are not enough are not of enough importance in our way of life now to form very much of an enemy. So science did not have very much of a case. It had no particular need to attack anyone terribly because no one was doing anything that was uh, particularly awful. Thus the situation sort of dwindled. And we come down to the year 1962 with a rather interesting and somewhat confusing picture in the relationships between science and the everyday life of our people. Also, we have to realize that scientists do get together, uh, that they have their own arguments and discussions, uh, that they are not really quite as certain of themselves as perhaps the press suggests. Perhaps they have had a certain aura of infallibility bestowed upon them, but they do not wear it with any great amount of real comfort. Uh, they are not too certain of their own position in many matters. One thing they have learned, however, within the last 15 years, and that is that science can be extremely dangerous now, they found this out in a world in which science is not even dominant. It has made a certain allegiance with policy in matters of armament. 
It has made an allegiance with society in matters of health and hygiene. It has made an allegiance in, with industry in terms of the advancement of a mechanistic way of life. And it has certainly dabbled strongly in the economy of the nation. But still the scientist is only a scientist, and around him moves a world with many other factors. He felt rather good about everything until he began to explore more deeply into his electronic mysteries. Here he found he was getting a little out of control. And uh, I know from talking to a number of these men that they're not quite comfortable. Uh, they're not so much worried about themselves. Science has come to more and more dominate our intellectual lives. Religion still plays a very large and positive part. And the family of the scientist may be devout in some faith, and even the scientist himself may acknowledge a nominal allegiance to some religion. In the vanguard of the scientific motion, of course, there were extremists. And uh, in humanism, these extremis extremists took a totally materialistic point of view, and we have gradually come to know them either as rather rabid agnostics or actual atheists. In the 20th century, atheism came into fashion in the Western world. It remained fashionable, however, only in certain groups and its influence was limited to a level of intelligence that was deeply immersed in the advancement of scientific knowledge. We cannot say that, generally speaking, uh, religion has been heavily penalized in the United States, for example, in the rise of science. Perhaps religion, however, has come under a certain negative disfavor. And in higher education especially, we find today skepticism as a basic symbol of intellectual maturity. The individual who believes is held to be unscientific. Gradually also, there arose this peculiar demarcation by which all knowledge was divided into fact and fantasy. Science became the custodian of fact and all other forms of learning, religion, art, culture, aesthetics, idealism, all of these were grouped together under the general heading of fantasy. Perhaps we can go even further and say that there is this division between science and superstition. What we have not realized is that no such dichotomy exists in nature. Nature does not say, this is fact and this is fancy. Nor does it divide with the, the constant persecution of progress. And he also liked, perhaps, to agree with Karl Marx, that most of the common social sins of mankind are due uh, to religion blocking the natural inquiry of the human mind. Being in this sense of the word a bit of a rebel in his own right, he gradually gathered others of his kind to become what might be termed campus atheists. They were young people, uh, they were sincere, uh, they were knight errants with not much of a cause, but they were doing the best they could. They felt, as many young people do, that they must fight for something. And today, in our way of thinking, when you fight for something, you must also fight against something. So by degrees, this group, growing older, got into some rather strategic positions 
and little by little, uh, the scientific world uh, began to feel the pressure of these uh, not mature, thoughtful atheists, but mostly just disillusioned people who, not having found God particularly interested in them, decided that they no longer had any interest in God. It was all rather amateurish, but it did produce a rather deep scar in our way of life. And this scar we still have to struggle with, because it has gradually indoctrinated a large part of our educational theory, and particularly in higher education, we are at least indirectly inspired to believe that we should not believe in anything except science and education. It has been, as we say, a slow fight, and I reiterate this for a particular purpose. I want to keep reminding you that this struggle uh, was up and through a nominally religious world. In this country, the little white churches have always been dotted throughout our communities. And contrary to many other countries, the young as well as the old were deeply devout in their religious allegiances. Today we probably have a, a very strong religious body in the United States. It is estimated at the approximately 90 million of our people. So actually, science never had its perfect works with us. It never was able to get completely rid of this This evening we wish to consider the problem of the relationship between science and what we call scientific materialism. In order to get the necessary perspective, we have to realize that in the progress of Western culture, man moved very gradually but relentlessly from a theistic to a humanistic foundation. The division in time is rather uncertain. There were both theists and humanists in Greece and in the Roman Empire. But we may say for general purposes that modern humanism began in the early 17th century following the Reformation, which more or less cleared the way for free thinking, and then gradually, slowly, and at first rather painfully, advanced its own purposes, which were consummated in both political and intellectual revolutions. The humanistic position rose in importance as man advanced in his knowledge of the natural sciences. In ancient times, scientific principles were known, but they were known much as religious principles were known. They were held as convictions by the learned. There was hardly enough available methodology to permit the scientific approach to knowledge that we know today. But in the 18th and later, more intensely, in the 19th century, the organization of human knowledge passed gradually into the keeping of astronomers, biologists, physicists, and to a measure psychologists. During this time, the struggle between religion and the rise of science was a very keen struggle. And in the United States particularly, this struggle continues even till now. 
while it is true that psychologically 